So hello, everyone, and good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the LSC Genders Welcome Lecture for 2023. My name is Sumi Madok, and I'm Professor of Political Theory and Gender Studies uh, at the Department of Gender Studies and also the Head of the Department. This is the first lecture and the big event of the Department's 30th anniversary calendar year. As the title suggests, the Welcome Lecture is an event to welcome the new cohort, so welcome all of you, to the Department and to the Department's intellectual life and world. Every year, the Welcome Lecture is given by a member of the Department's faculty. It showcases an important strand of the state-of-the-art research that is carried out in the Department and introduces the Department's students to global thinking on gender. Our faculty are agenda-setting global thinkers who work on important and difficult questions that animate contemporary thinking on our planet. Their research and teaching, because MSc teaching at the LSE is research-led, is led by an urgency to not only respond to, but also intervene in contemporary gendered life and living around the globe. This year, which is also our 30th anniversary year, the wel welcome lecture will be given by Dr. Anya Palomin. The title of her lecture is Social Reproduction, Struggles for and Visions of Justice. Dr. Plomine is the Deputy Head of Department for Research, and, and she's a feminist political economist interested in micro and macro level processes that shape gender inequality in relation to social reproduction, care and employment, transnational labor mobility, and the policy processes that affect them. Her long-standing interests and work engages the ways in which inequalities in access to and command over resources and power are experienced and how they get reproduced and reproduced and challenged through everyday relations in paid and unpaid work and care and the role of policy interventions in these. Her expertise spans contemporary Europe, including the UK, and especially Central and Eastern Europe, Poland and Ukraine. Dr. Plomin's work has been influential in engaging academic, civil society and policy making actors. She convenes the Gender Equality Policy and End Practice Group on Equal Pol Pay Policy in Action and is a member of the Policy Advisory Group of Women's Budget Group. She is also a faculty associate at the LSE International Inequalities Institute. I'm sure by now you're all very extremely, very extremely, but you know what I mean, extremely interested in, in her work. And so can I suggest that you take a very quick look and a long look at her LSE faculty webpage, which provides details of her publications and interventions. In particular, you may be very interested on some of her recent work, which has been on the COVID-19 global pandemic and has been looking closely at social reproduction and state responses to the COVID-19 around the globe. So the, uh, before I ask Dr. Plomin to come and deliver the lecture, the order of this afternoon's events then is as follows. Dr. Plomin will deliver her lecture for around 42, three, <laughs> five minutes, six, okay, 46 minutes. And uh, this will be followed by an audience Q&A, so that's your chance to ask Dr. Plomin uh, questions. And after that, there will be a congratulatory reception uh, just outside the lecture theater in the foyer uh, to, of course, congratulate Dr. Plomin on her splendid lecture and for everyone to get a chance to mingle over drinks. So, everyone, I give you Dr. Plomin. Thank you so much. This does sound like a proper giveaway, um, and we may have to huggle over a minute or two, but we'll, we'll see. Um, Professor Sumi Marok, thank you. Um, okay. In what I'd like to um, first start is to say thank you, everybody, for coming. It's very lovely to see you here. Thank you. Can everybody hear me at the back? Yes, OK, great. Um, so thank you. It's a rainy and uh, very windy afternoon, so I'm very pleased to see you here in this cozy, and cozy environment. Um, I'd like to start first with a footnote, um, the footnote reflection on the title, uh, Social Reproduction, Struggles for, and Visions of Justice. The title reflects a number of wide range of prompts. 
how do we partake in the everyday struggle to reproduce ourselves uh, as individuals, as communities, as societies? How does this struggle to reproduce ourselves comprise of questions of agency, of status, and of material aspects of what we can do, of who we can be, and of what we can have? And therefore, it draws attention to the political, to the cultural, and to the material or economic aspects of the processes that are either supportive to or are hostile to the uh, project of gender social justice. And so my own research interests and the focus of this talk are framed by these larger concerns, but I, of course, do not do all of them despite the very generous introduction uh, provided by Sunil Madog. So the setting for today's um, intervention lecture is that we are in a difficult and an anxious or anxiety-provoking pro moment. But it's also a contradictory moment. There are multiple crises that have unfolded over the last few decades. And these have often been examined discreetly as the economic crisis, financial crash and austerity, as political crisis, the rise of illiberalism, authoritarianism, international and civil wars, cultural crisis in the contestations of identity and status claims, and a backlash countering uh, different social revolutions that have been occurring since the 1960s, for example. And there is also the environmental, ecological tipping point that comes into the fold of thinking about the crisis. The crises are deep, wide, frequent. They are overlapping in time and space, and they leave a lasting scar or scars on people and places, amplifying old and creating new injustices. Commentators have also noted or made visible the entanglements among these discrete crises. So whether they are economic or non-economic shocks, Nancy Fraser, Sylvia Warby, Arundhati Roy have discussed these uh, extensively. Adam Tooze argues that today's disparate shocks interact so that the whole is worse than the sum of its parts, increasingly understood as a polycrisis, drawing on complexity theorist Edgar Morin. And so the impacts of these multiple or interacting crises, whether we take them separately or altogether as a totality, reveal themselves in various ways. So we have the rise of poverty and inequality, loss of livelihood. Um, Diane Perrins asks whether austerity is gendered. At a time of huge creation of wealth, of lower absolute poverty levels, and medical progress. So there are some contradictions there. We have large scale movements of people, labor, conflict, climate migrations that represent both compulsion and a freedom to move. And we also have contestations of women's and gender rights. These are accompanied uh, by institutionalization of gender equality, legally outlawing discrimination. Women have joined economic and political elites banks fly the rainbow liberation flag, marriage adoption rights have been extended to non-binary people, and new forms of resistance are permeating and apparent as documented by the project led by Claire Hemmings and Sumi Madok in the transnational anti-gender movements and resistance. Environmental disasters of catastrophic proportions and innovative technological and social fixes offer possibilities to slow climate change. So in sum, the systemic marginalization that we are witnessing march side by side with the consolidation of power and privilege and with ingenuity that could make this all go away or at least attenuate some of the worst excesses. And so the implications of a complex understanding of crisis is that neither a single cause, explanation, or a single solution will do. And so the task at hand 
is to reflect on the kind of proposals that we have on the agenda. And just taking a brief look around suggests or makes clear that there are ideas, there are visions, and there are ambitions. And these are spreading particularly um, in abundance after the 2008 economic financial crisis, but also after the pandemic. From building back better to demanding a new normal, there are lots of calls and institutional proposals um, out there. There have been many demands to end austerity, at a minimum restoring the status quo before the 2008 crash. The UN has a raft sustainable development goals, which will have been adopted by all UN member states as a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet, now and into the future. And the UN environmental program, the green economy, suggests that the green economy is a viable approach for countries interested in pursuing an inclusive and sustainable growth strategies. And also recent movements in terms of a tax, international global tax regime, have been, have been supported and strengthened by the change of leadership in some countries like the US. And so there seems to be some bridging between civil society demands and some political will from the top. And so the sheer scope and depth of challenges that we might imagine, or as Shirin Rai has conceptualized as the good life, requires attention to all the dimensions of life that is so bad for so many, but also life that's actually not so bad for many others. Faluka Adibisi warns, and she's referring to the uh, UK higher education sector and its refusal to see change uh, and to change, uh, but is applicable to also other uh, institutional contexts more widely, is that we live in a hope that before it destroys us, at least it feeds us, sustains us for a while. And Adebisi asks, are we just hoping to be fed and sustained for a while? So keeping in the frame both the good life and the bad through this dialectic approach, um, I'd like to suggest that we need indeed um, a crucial uh, rethinking about what the interventions that I have presented right now um, should and uh, how they should be thought about and connected. And so a multi-pronged approach to inequality and injustice has not always been the guiding light for feminist scholars uh, and feminist activists. Crudely, there were many different divisions that, ha that have developed over the years but socialist feminists being busy transforming the gender division of labor, radical feminists focusing on law, sexuality, violence, liberal insisting on eliminating discrimination um, and exclusion, and of course, intersectional efforts in underscoring the interlocking systems of domination. And while challenging for feminist theories and feminist politics, there are many efforts to think and act across the divide. Patricia Hill Collins, Black Feminist Thought, Chara Talpade Mohanty in Feminist Solidarity Through Anti-Capitalist Struggles, and Anne Phillips articulate some of these concerns for a need of a bigger, bigger picture. Anne Phillips um, defines the concern with, with equality and social justice as such. Recognizing others as equals is not something that can be done merely by adjusting attitudes and changing beliefs. For failing certain material conditions, the recognition becomes an empty word. The opposite is also true, for there are ways of providing for people with the material resources they need that fail to treat them as equals, that treat them like children or as objects of pity, or subject them to demeaning tests to determine whether they qualify for support." End of quote. And for Nancy Fraser, with, with whose, whose work I also follow and inform some of the conceptualization of this research, combating inequality requires integrated, subord, integrated pursuit of economic, of cultural, and of political justice. Although for her, market-mediated processes of subordination and the contradiction between capital and care 
come to the fore as the root of the problem. And so I'm mostly um, concerned with the material uh, focusing on inequality and thinking about the politics of uh, distribution where economic resources have been and are unequally distributed. But I'm working with and not against uh, the arguments that urge the pursuit of projects uh, that are about status and agency, those that align more closely with the politics uh, of the cultural and the political uh, spheres. And so to me, this is an analytical focus distinction and a practical one, uh, not a real separation. And the connections have been articulated uh, throughout uh, feminist uh, theory uh, over the last few decades, where the interdependence between status and so demanding uh, politics of recognition as equals uh, and material equality is pertinent in the analysis of inequality uh, in capitalism because of how social differences translate into material value differentiations. What that means is that labor, the work we perform and uh, how it is understood, is determined by geo-social historical forms of value. Various mar markers of difference, social markers of difference, such as gender or race, are drawn into the material processes of value creation and appropriation. This difference, the social difference, is turned into an inequality and capital can use markers of difference that are socially constructed to be hierarchical. And these are then folded into surplus value appropriation. In other words, capital can use existing differences between people to extract more value from some laborers versus others, for example, by lowering wages among certain groups. And here I follow the work of uh, Diane Elson. And so value, wages, and inequality are socially determined according to that logic. They are differentiated by gender, race, and ethnicity rather than reflect the production cost or the toil and trouble in the words of Adam Smith. So differences between people are turned into differences uh, of value. The interdependence between agency and material equality too is pertinent in the analysis of inequality in capitalism because of how self-determination, political demands for representation, how they are linked to distributive justice. And so following here Iris Marion Young, the way resources are distributed grants some people means to coerce others. These resources allow them to coerce others. And the conflict between the workers and the owners of means of production over how the total value that's being produced socially in society is then a political process in which the state, through its laws, expresses the outcome of these conflicting forces between, between uh, laborers and capital. And this process is one of establishing a hegemonic block to consent to a specific arrangement between classes. So the, hege the, the capturing, the, 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 the hegemonic struggle suggests that, again, returning to Iris Marion Young, decisions over production, how that surplus value that we produce must be established democratically connects the political and the material equality that we are seeking. And this brings me to theorizing um, social reproduction. And I turn to social reproduction as an analytical framework as well as object of analysis. And this guides our understanding in the struggle for gender social justice uh, in our time that's marked by political, economic, and cultural deficits. And so typically, most typically, as you see the image uh, taken from UN Women, uh, social reproduction is, refers to the biological reproduction of people combined with the labor associated with mothering. Raising children, looking after adults with care needs is one way of uh, understanding this. 
And so it is this understanding that social reproduction and production are divided, that productive and reproductive labor take place in separate spheres and highlights the gendered and naturalized character of unpaid domestic labor and care. But this narrow conceptualization has been challenged uh, by demonstrating that the unpaid character of domestic labor is not a reality for a large segment of paid domestic uh, workers, vastly women of color, and Angela Davis, Evelyn Nakano Glenn would be, uh, would be uh, the theorists and the researchers that have made that point very forcefully. It also takes place transnationally through an international transfer of reproductive work, the work of Russell Perenas, Eleanor Kaufman, Parvati Raguram uh, highlights that as well. But also the gendered ha character of uh, needs interrogating as well. The paid and unpaid domestic labor of men where gender, class, and migration uh, interlock in the reemergence of commodification of domestic labor constructed as men's work, and that's uh, the work that um, I have done with Magella Kilke and Diane Perrins, suggests that we have to think about social reproduction beyond these narrow terms. And finally, these critiques help to conceptualize a broader understanding of social reproduction articulated by social reproduction feminists as the daily and intergenerational reproduction of workers that refer to those processes and to those practices of direct production relations that, that, that are outside of these productive uh, relations, but they are necessary to the survival of capitalism. Because what they do is that they are used to replenish and reproduce workers in a daily basis and intergenerationally. So this socially reproductive labor is productive in the sense of producing life. The activities, attitudes, behaviors, emotions, the responsibilities, relationships that are directly involved in the maintenance of life on a daily basis and intergenerationally is a quote from Barbara Laslett and Johanna Brenner's um, definition. This requires time, skill, ability, and it entails unpaid household production that nevertheless depends and it's closely intimately linked with wages, with state provision, and with the work of others, as well as market substitutes. And so while I mentioned the household, the state, and the market combining in the provisioning for social reproduction goods and services, there's also a key role that communities play in this, the voluntary sector, as well as the queering care um, initiatives suggest, initiatives and theorization, the work of Sasha Rosnell, for example. Not all the social reproductive work, not all the caring work can be neatly confined to the household and unpaid labor by women. And so, in the broadest sense, social reproduction is also conceptualized as that work, that effort, these activities that contribute to the overall regeneration of capitalism, of the reproduction of capital labor relations. Um, and they include waged work and monetized practice within the nexus of other activities that produce and rep reproduce working class life. And so an important contribution of socialist feminist uh, to understanding social reproduction is that this is a necessary and a contradictory uh, process. This relationship has a necessary and a contradictory character uh, between the relationship of production in the marketplace of surplus value and the reproduction of life on a <coughs> daily basis. So, Capital does not directly produce labor power, but it needs workers, it needs labor as a source of surplus value and profit for capital. On the other hand, labor derives wages from capital, which, with, which households can be reproduced. There is very little possibility for people outside uh, of that 
wage relationship to subsist. And so recourse to wages is paramount. Wage generating activities are important to people's everyday life and their reproduction. And so there is a contradictory nature of this relationship because, of course, the capital drives to accumulate by constantly lowering the costs for workers to socially reproduce. And so reproduction of capital takes place at the expense of social reproduction, of the reproduction of workers. This constant pressure to lower the costs of social reproduction, the tendency to lower the contradictions for the conditions for social reproduction leads to uh, depletions. And that's the work by uh, both Diane Elson, but also Shirin Rai and colleagues uh, has, has articulated. As households and as communities get depleted because the resources are not sufficiently available for them to reproduce, various, various struggles, various mitigations take place, including transnational migration. Seems I think I hovered too long on that social reproduction theory. Uh, so one of the ways in which societies respond to work through that struggle for survival, struggle to socially reproduce, uh, given that more and more pressure is being put on people um, through capitalist forces of production. Uh, one of these responses is transnational labor mobility on mobility uh, altogether. In three theses on neoliberal migration and social reproduction, uh, Thomas Snell argues that the 21st century will be the century of the migrant, that the increase in human mobility and expulsion affects us all. It should be recognized as a defining feature of our epoch. And indeed, in the last five decades, there has been uh, an increase in the level of transnational migrant uh, migration globally. And current estimates that are uh, from the World Migration Report suggest uh, that these are rising very rapidly in Europe, very rapidly in Asia, but are on the rise in all regions of the world. Um, these are looking at uh, transnational migration, international migration, but of course we have many, many, many areas in which uh, inter internal migration takes place as well for similar reasons. The movement of people is also associated with the movement of money. Uh, there has been an increase in remittances over the last few decades as well. And the current uh, estimates suggest that more than 700 billion are remitted every, every year. India, China, Mexico, and the Philippines, and Egypt are the top five recipient countries. The main sources of these remittances globally are the US, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Switzerland, Germany. International migration has increased also, especially uh, in Europe, uh, where it exceeds now 86 million. And in the labor market, non-European or non-EU citizens are overrepresented in particular occupations, cleaners and helpers, personal service workers, personal care workers, building and related trades workers, food preparation assistants, agricultural, forestry and fishing, are these sectors where migrant workers are overrepresented in comparison with the local populations. Many of these um, occupations are what we have now come to label, but not recognize as such, uh, essential workers. Over the last few 
decades, a couple, we see also a large transnational labor migration following um, European Union's enlargement to the East uh, in 2004. You see large numbers of Polish who are considered EU-born and large numbers of Ukrainian who are considered third country nationals moving across borders for work. Uh, Poland is the second largest country of origin of EU mobile workers and Ukraine is the largest external country of origin of workers in the EU and these are numbers before the war so they don't capture uh, the refugee movements of people. And Poland for Ukrainian workers is the main destination. Poland and Ukraine share a border, Poland and Ukraine share a history and now are of course more intimately and intensively linked through, uh, through war relief efforts at the, so at the societal and the state uh, levels. So one of the questions uh, that, that I pose uh, in, this, in this research on transnational labor mobility is why such high numbers of Polish people are on the move to Germany and to the UK, while at the same time, large numbers of Ukrainian workers are on the move to Poland. Polish workers seek Western European uh, destinations for seasonal, for temporary, and for permanent labor uh, migration. And Poland's accession to the European Union in 2004 has amplified this pattern. Poles represent the largest foreign-born group of people in Germany. And you see in this uh, tricky map of Europe, uh, Germany is renamed Poland to represent uh, the, the second uh, largest, the first largest, so the second largest population outside of Germans who were born in Germany. And so um, Poles also represent the second largest group of people born outside, uh, outside of the UK after India. So in India, so in, in the UK, Indians are the largest uh, non-UK born uh, uh, populations. Since mid 2000s, um, especially since 2014, uh, reori reorienting their migratory movement away from Russia, uh, Ukrainian workers have found jobs in Poland. And there has been a steady increase, especially among men, uh, the total reach reaching nearly 1.8 million with uh, refugee uh, numbers. Of course, this is much higher. So how does this pattern, this phenomenon of large scale mobility uh, fit with the contradictory uh, narratives of post-socialism claiming on the one hand, a qualified success of transition or an epic catastrophe as questioned by Kristen Godzi and Mitchell Orenstein. The large east to west tra transnational labor mobility relates, relates to the interconnected issues of decent work and social protection, where deficits in work and protection put pressure on social reproduction locally and people seek solutions to these pressures transnationally. And so while many of the post-socialist countries experienced significant improvements uh, in living standards and life satisfaction since the 1989-91 uh, fall uh, of socialism, many have suffered demographic and social collapse resulting from rising economic precarity, degradation of the welfare systems that came with privatization and a growing gender, class and regional uh, pattern of disparities that have accompanied neoliberal uh, reforms. I won't touch on every single one of these, of, of these points uh, on, on this timeline, but neoliberalization of the state is key to understanding uh, the processes of social reproduction in an even and combined Europe, and here with the example of Poland and Ukraine. Um, the two countries have started more or less from a similar social economic position uh, 30 years ago, just over 30 years ago. But Poland, with its uh, design of shock therapy, of a neoliberalization by design, where a deliberate program of neoliberal policies um, was implemented, uh, has embarked on a slightly different, uh, different trajectory than Ukraine, where neoliberalization by default 
was uh, a much more in fits and starts, and so less uh, less coherent in that in that programmatic sense. State socialism, the collapse, why is this relevant? Is, and is this relevant, people ask, scholars ask, does this have relevance for, uh, for people outside of state socialist countries? State socialism represented a powerful alternative uh, system to global capitalism. But its collapse put Ukraine and Poland on a course of integration with that system and their economic, political, and household spheres through that process have been significantly uh, reconfigured. Reforms since the 1989-91 transition were meant to be an extension of political, economic, and cultural freedoms. They were sought in the regions. Liberty was that which workers organized for and fought to achieve. Assistance by global institutions from the free world, however, instead of liberty, embedded neoliberalism. The neoliberalization of the state and the state policies meant that there was a strong commitment to market efficiency, labor market flexibility, and welfare reforms that encouraged market participation. So weakening of that element of provisioning that was publicly available uh, resulted from three decades of neoliberal reforms in the region. And these have been pursued in both countries. As a result, Poland, Poland's income inequality is one of the highest uh, among EU member states, and so is wage dispersion, so the difference between the high and low wage ratios. And people from Poland see <coughs> decent employment opportunities abroad as one of the main reasons uh, of their migration migration of Polish workers. <coughs> Liberalization of the labor market, mass out-migration, falling unemployment, but also consistent and rising uh, economic growth, something that we hear as should be guiding our economic policies everywhere, we need more growth. Despite that growth, uh, these, these policies and these processes um, meant that for a large proportion of population, livelihood was very hard. At the same time, uh, there have been liberalizations of the visa regime in Poland, making Poland one of the most liberal systems for migrants' access to the labor market. But of course, many of you will know that this, this uh, access, this liberal access to, to Poland for migrants is very much conditioned by where is this, this migration is coming from, the origin of this migration. At the same time, large numbers of Ukrainians uh, have reoriented away from Russia. And so uh, Poland, that earned the label of the poster child of transition based on its economic performance, also has entrenched class regional uh, inequalities and gender inequalities as well. Public welfare provisioning has cut income support uh, measures of health expenditure, but developed markets, markets for childcare, markets for el elderly care, and so the care infrastructure is growing, but it is funded by uh, funded or, ra or run by private rather than state uh, actors. The same socioeconomic uh, growth indicators for Ukraine uh, did not happen. Ukraine was one of the weakest of the 27 post-communist transition countries. In the early years of transformation, it set on a different course. And their oligarchic power and oscillation between commitments to align with the EU versus Russia have impeded those kind of reforms that were pursued in Poland. They brought industrial decline, low wages, informality, underemployment, and multiple job holding. And rather than attracting the foreign capital that Poland was so keen to bring in within its borders, uh, the solution was to perhaps bring workers to where the capital is outside of Ukraine. And so the key problem for Ukraine was then the growth of informal employment within the country 
aside from low and unpredictable pay, job insecurity, and poor labor practices. And this has contributed to the weakening of the social insurance fund and make, made many formerly free social benefits virtually meaningless. And so the economic crisis has hit Ukraine particularly hard, and it was very heavily indebted, which meant that, again, the uh, transnational, uh, international financial institutions, the IMF, International Mon Monetary Fund, the European Union, have stepped in with loans that were conditional on certain arrangements, arrangements that further decimated provisioning for people through social services. And so uh, Ukraine has been more closely aligned with the EU since about 2014 and, and in the recent years. But this also meant that the single market uh, created not just visa liberalization for Ukrainian workers, but also produced massive, uh, massive uh, requirements for Ukraine to meet the standards uh, that are currently being pursued at the EU level. So in Poland and in Ukraine, segments of the population achieved the promise of a better life, but vast segments suffered. And in this neoliberal regime of accumulation, the state regulated access to the means of subsistence in ways that devalue certain workers in relation to others. This is done via precarity wages, Yulia Yurchenko names this as an ongoing dispossession of labor with little or no compensation, and via curtailing private uh, public provision. Olena Lyubchenko lists uh, the items that had been provided in the past or subsidized by the socialist state, care, health, leisure, price controls, full employment. These were areas in which now markets reach deeper making social reproduction the ultimate frontier of accumulation and popular struggle. And so there is a boundary struggle between production, where the neoliberal state prioritizing, uh, prioritizes the needs of capital to attract or, or retain investment, and social reproduction, where 30 years of post-socialism did not fulfill the dream of liberty and prosperity and uh, it springs either the rise of populism, uh, population decline, high migration, or indeed, as in the case of Poland, uh, a combination of all three. And so market, markets reach deep into social reproduction, and I just wanted to uh, refer to a couple of uh, interviews with Polish and Ukrainian uh, migrant workers this is drawing uh, on research with Gregory Schwartz at the University of Bristol um, to flesh out some of these dialectics between the global forces of production and the local needs of social reproduction. We've done uh, interviews with almost 40 uh, Polish and migrant workers who are working in Germany and in the UK and in Poland. Uh, they work in food, housing and care sectors these are the sectors that have both experienced quite a high degree of marginalization, but also these areas, food, shelter, care, are fundamental to how we can flourish and how we can actually survive. Um, so I'd like to uh, draw out just a few themes in, in relation to, to this research. Um, this example, uh, suggests that necessities of provisioning, these are two examples, um, are a driving force for uh, many of the migrant workers we spoke with and many who are not part of this research. Um, here is a quote from Vasil, uh, a Ukrainian construction worker working in Poland. And his, uh, he comes from a rural area in Ukraine where he did not get regular pay for his labor often was owed wages for two or three months at a time. And so he went to Lithuania first um, for work and then to Poland where I interviewed him uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, Vasil was commenting on how well this delaying, not paying of wages 
You don't get it here in Poland. Back home, yes, in the village, there are so many who don't get paid even for three months. And here it's regular, every month, on the eighth, if not on the eighth, then the ninth. And there in Ukraine, they, they delay. Four years ago, when I was working in Lithuania, I had a stroke and needed emergency treatment. When I went back to Ukraine to recover, I don't know what happened, but there was a problem with insurance. They did not pay the hospital. So now I have this huge debt, thousands of euros, and the government didn't help. I must work in Poland for that and for my family. An example from Agata, who is a, a pediatric nurse with a master's degree in nursing uh, from Poland. Um, her income did not reflect her degree nor a sense of pride in her profession. Um, she felt entitled to a decent wage, something you can apparently obtain in England. And so Agatha, uh, I interviewed her in, in London, and she stated that she was a pediatric nurse. I liked it, but to be honest, it was not sustainable. Working during my studies was better, as there weren't so many social security contributions. After graduation, we had to pay premiums, and then they started these new contracts in healthcare. So suddenly, wages dropped. There was so little you could do with this money. I always joke that it was the 1500 Zwotys generation. No matter what degree you got, you were earning 1500 Zwotys. So I realized that I have to look for something else. I did not believe these big adverts that a nurse abroad earns 20,000 Zwotys. Unfortunately, people don't talk about the cost of living being so much more, at least 5,000 for a room. A major theme uh, of this transnational migration story is migrants and their families' deferral of their own social reproduction. Um, and this is an example from Anita and Yarek, who both are residing in the UK, but the first five years there was a separation. Yarek, a construction worker, has come to England, whereas his wife and children stayed behind. And the first five years entailed transnational householding. So when I asked Agata, Anita how they managed, uh, Anita replied, we had to. In fact, the whole house was on my shoulders because my husband went away as we were finalizing the construction, but we still had to do this and that, finish the interiors, and I was left in charge of it all. Our son was helping a bit, but he was still in school and my mother was sick. She had Alzheimer's. She needed 24 seven care. So I had to look after her, which is also why I did not come to see Yarek here in Germany, in UK on vacation. I could not just leave her and with both of my brothers in Germany. Now that we're here in England together, we're finding it a little hard as obviously we will never feel at home here. We will never be accepted fully as ourselves there our families there, mother, son, the whole family is there, the whole life center. Our lifelong friends are there. We have friends here too, but they are kind of acquired over five or six years. And so when Anita joined Yarek in the UK, they shared a room in a house with all the other builders until she found a cleaning job and they rented a flat on their own. And this is a common example how with the lower wages that Polish migrants and Ukrainian migrants earn, they need to find other ways to, to, to make do uh, in terms of their living costs. Daria, who works on a Polish farm, uh, lives with other farm workers in a converted farm office. And this is a picture of that farm office, three to four women or men per room with a shared kitchen and laundry kitchen facilities. For Ina, the deferral of own social reproduction was also about time. Um, as a carer in a care home, which she, which she left to, to work in a private home, she talked about how they worked for 12 hour days, starting at 7 a.m. nonstop the whole day, every day, 
No difference, weekdays or weekends. I had little time for anything, some shopping, that's all. Every hour there was some task, moving from one to another. I looked after many women, feeding, making beds, organizing clothes, washing them, grooming them, feeding, washing again. All day, non-stop. It's not like at home, where I can stop or do something now or later or differently. It was constant. And as markets become more dominant and push people to migrate, migration becomes an aspect of a marketized society, something that Anatoly expressed as a positive, naturalized also, uh, in, a, in a naturalized manner. Anatoly um, is a young agricultural college student, so Anatoly was migrating to Germany for a few months at a time to work on a farm. And uh, his narrative is that many Ukrainians are not willing to emigrate or even move from villages or towns to cities. People love where they're from, their vegetable patches. I'm more of a risk taker. I'm young, don't yet have responsibilities, want to use time while at college to make money, gain experience, skills. It's not an ideal job, but being in Germany, it doesn't matter that I am a migrant. I can use it as a kind of self-improvement or new experience. I can say I worked in Germany, which will be valuable in Ukraine. These uh, kind of questions come up over and over again. The negotiation of whether migration is something that is welcomed and positive or something that is more of a struggle. Um, for vetoed uh, particular workers uh, in, in the process of, of markets reaching deeper into a social reproduction, particular workers become too expensive uh, in, the, in the areas in which uh, migration is becoming um, a solution to cheapen production costs. And so productive subjectivity and the value of labor power uh, progressively loses trace of their origin. It is the needs of firms to relocate or import new sources of cheap, compliant, enthusiastic laborers that come through, through the um, interview with Witold. Witold is a Polish agricultural worker in the UK and uh, talks about the farm that he has worked on for more than a decade and talks about the owner of this farm who tried to hire locals. This lasted maximum three months. It took eight people to do the job normally done by three migrants. In the end, my boss started to realize that he should respect migrants' work better. We now have mostly Poles, Bulgarians, Romanians, and Latvians, and to be honest, Brits would not work for this kind of money doing the same job. And so differentiated value is then uh, one of the key themes emerging. Here both Daria and Ursula express it, but in very different ways. Uh, Daria, who works on a farm, talks about what it's like to work, uh, to work in Poland on a Polish farm. You have to wash vegetables and the water is very cold, or stand sorting and packing all day. In the summer, in hot weather, we weed in the field, but it's fine. I mean, we work 12 hours. On Saturdays, we have a shorter eight hour day, and on Sundays, we're off. Poles working here work for eight hours, and we have to stay on and finish. Some of our tasks are worse than what the Poles do. It is tough standing 12 hours washing leaks in cold water, so I'm cold, my hands and my feet are cold, but I'm used to it. And the managers are used to me. Everything they ask me to do, I do. Daria go there, do this and do that. And they know that I will do everything the best I can. For Ursula, um, who says, who works in a care, care home in the UK, in England, uh, she says, we have a fantastic team but we always have shortages. We have one dementia unit and people with dementia need support. They don't walk alone. We also have end of life care. We have shortages because, well, to be honest, I work four and a half days a week. 
But there are people, English mainly, who work two or three days. And this sector really demands 24 hour a day. I'm still registered with an agency and I keep getting calls that we have massive gaps, massive. My manager knows that I'm flexible and that if I feel well and she needs me to come, we're on WhatsApp. If there is an emergency, when I have two days off, she texts if I can cover a shift. I have a 36 hour contract, but I work over 50, so 208, 240 hours a month. My manager asks which unit I'd prefer. And I say, I don't care. I can work on this unit or any other unit. And she says, we need workers like you. You know, we're very happy that you are with us. And so to finalize, uh, or maybe coming back to Daria and Ursula, doing the same job uh, as her English co-workers and formerly entitled to the same working conditions, arrangements that are facilitated by EU freedom of movement, the legal framework, and that was pre-Brexit uh, UK, uh, there is no clear advantage that the employer can take through pay. But the massive gaps that uh, Ursula is called on to fill seem to be compensated by the praise from management and her own sense of personal achievement of professional duty that goes beyond that of her colleagues. This acceptance of differentiation through pride contrasts with Daria's uh, acceptance of differentiation, who also values recognition as a reliable employee, but she does not have the same legal status as the local workers, and therefore those working hours uh, that are locally imposed are something that is much more of a uh, compelling uh, explanation. And so differentiated value can be uh, also expressed with a cynical distance. Um, in Agatha's case, uh, who, who Agatha is the pediatric nurse, she says, I don't know if it matters that much, but I think as Poles, we are appreciated here. Very often, especially in the context of Brexit, my patients ask where I'm from. I say that I'm from Poland, to which they say, I hope you will not go back because we have shortages. And I laugh that we also lack nurses in Poland, but we need you more here, they laugh sometimes. You can see that they don't want to, that they don't want to lose their nurses, and maybe it will be harder for us. They are so smart. They would like to keep migration to specific occupations, those they need, and they know that nurses from Poland are so family friendly, warm, we have good qualities, we know how to work hard, and that a nurse from Poland has a good reputation that she can create something out of nothing. Monika, uh, Monika I should say, demonstrates the sheer drudgery, drudgery of work in food production, one of the sectors in which migrant workers in Western Europe are overrepresented. Um, and she works uh, in, a, in a factory that processes uh, cold cuts for a major supermarket. And she says that they start with heavy meat, heavy, um, with very, very heavy meat, large pieces that need to be emptied out of different boxes, thrown onto the cutting line, and then we move to stacking, and women usually do it because it is light work. Slice, cut, and stack the meat. Then it goes on the scales, then it's automatically packed, and at the end, you have to put everything in boxes, four, eight, 10, 20 packs, then 20 boxes on a pallet, 40 boxes, 60 boxes. Well, after eight hours of work, even after two hours stacking these boxes, you get tired. And mostly women were on these production lines, which is more suited to men than women. But there are probably more women at my workplace. You just stand packing those burgers, these meatballs, on each line, four to eight people standing and packing all day. And so underpinning the logics of social reproduction, depletion, and uh, survival strategies, the contradiction between relations of production and forces of production stand in the way of realizing flourishing social reproduction. Monika's father was a firefighter in Poland, 
and she is drawn to this occupation. She'd like to join the fire, fire brigade. Or alternatively, she recently had a small child, she'd like to be employed in social work, making visits to new mothers and support their emotional well-being. Both these desirable occupations to her mean, mean something more val valuable than the job she is currently doing, than work in a food processing plant. And so Polish and Ukrainian migrant workers improve their social reproduction needs by migrating uh, Ukrainians to Poland or Poles to Germany and the UK only in a very patchy way. They obtain some gains that are based on deferring the more flourishing levels of welfare. Some realize the projects that they have set out to do by moving. Others do not. Others endure material hardship, experience the breakdown of family relationships that they did not foresee or wanted to see happen. And so transnational labor mobility solidifies state uh, abnegation in social reprodu reproduction. In countries of origin, as securing wages abroad makes up for state non-provisioning. And in countries of destination, as local workers resort to market consumption of cheaper goods and services to make up also for that non-provisioning by the state. And so migrant workers, transnational households um, and networks and the state policies that support these institutionalize dramatically lower, lower costs of social reproduction. Capital and the state draw from a pool of cost-free labor, uh, labor power on whose past social reproduction they did not spend a penny, a zwoty, or a hryvnia. And because access to decent working conditions and state provisioning is denied to them or restricted uh, in, in the places of destination. And so these countries incur, or the states of these countries incur, relatively little expense directed at the migrant workforce ongoing regeneration. And so this research uh, demonstrates the dimensions of injustice that are experienced through the processes of global social reproduction, which rely on and produce inequalities. It's several decades of neoliberal policies, both in these countries of origin, but also destination, that have been uh, that have resulted uh, in these in these outcomes. Both governments that are aligned with the left and the right in Poland or Ukraine have produced these policies. The political map of the left-right divide, which has become much more uh, troubling uh, in Europe and elsewhere, underscores the limits of pursuing justice in neoliberal terms. And so the left and the right today are not, by the same token, all the same. Um, they are still distinguished by, on the one hand, a continued commitment to social democracy and socially progressive discourse in cultural terms and on the other by an illiberal Kulturkampf uh, package together with some redistributive policies as we have seen in Poland, in Hungary and, and elsewhere. And so with the left and the right politics pursued over the last few decades, there is a disconnect between status, representation and distribution uh, concerns and a problem that needs uh, to be remedied. What unites them is the core tendencies of capitalism that impede socially just redistribution. Development of our capacity to flourish uh, comes up against the barrier of capitalist production, the basic contradiction of capitalism. So I just want to finish with a quote uh, who, that was spoken by Rose Schneiderman in the summer of 1912, uh, a labor activist and uh, women's trade union league member. Um, and Rose Schneiderman addressed middle class women organizing for suffrage in Ohio. And she said to them, what the woman who labors wants is the right to live, not simply exist. 
The right to rise as the rich woman has the right to her life as the sun and music and art. You have nothing that the humblest workers have not a right to have also. The worker must have bread, but she must have roses too. Thank you.